Thank you all for joining us today. We're going to go ahead and get started with our class. Um, and as we do so, let me start with a word of prayer and then I'll explain where we're going. Father, come, be amongst us. In the power of your spirit, may Christ dwell in our hearts through faith. We pray that you would open our minds to behold the wonders of your word, that you would incline our hearts to your testimony, that you would unite our hearts in the fear of your name, and that you would satisfy us this morning with your steadfast love. For it is in you we trust. Please be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, <clears throat> we've been walking through the five solas of the Reformation. The five solas in reference to the word in Latin alone. That we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone, as revealed to us in Scripture alone. Now that may seem obvious to those of us who grew up in the evangelical faith, but we have to understand that there are many other religions, in fact there are other traditions and denominations, even within Christianity, that would argue for something to the contrary. In fact, the five souls of the Reformation really come out of a recovery of the gospel that took place during the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, the 16th century. Martin Luther standing up and saying, let's go back to the source, let's go back to what Jesus actually said in his word, what his apostles wrote down for us as revealed to them through the Holy Spirit, and let us use that as the guide for our faith, for our understanding of doctrine, and for how we are to live. And so we've walked through, we believe that Christ and Christ alone is the means of our salvation. We believe that the Bible and the Bible alone is the final authority for faith and practice in the life of a Christian. We believe that we are saved through faith in Jesus and not through our good works, not through the sacraments, not through being a good person or just because you're a wonderful little snowflake. None of those things count in the sight of God by ourselves because even our good deeds, Isaiah tells us, are like filthy rags before the Lord. Because every one of your good works is always mixed with the motivations of the heart that are not pure. Today, however, um, Pastor Peter is preaching from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and, and Paul has in mind head coverings. And, and as we're talking about head coverings, and, and about really just one of the most difficult passages of the Scripture, and we're actually going to hit another one in a few weeks when we get to the baptism of the dead, for the dead, um, it, it occurs to me that we need to take a moment to actually consider how we read our Bible. If we truly are to be a Bible people, if we are a people that stand on the principle of sola scriptura, that the Bible and the Bible alone is God's final word for our faith, then we really have to examine what does it mean to read our Bible and read it rightly. And, and so I had a different class all picked out, and, and if we have time, I'm going to get to a little bit of it. Um, but during the first service, I, I really felt led, and I, I don't want to make this too supernatural here, um, but I, I really feel it's important for us to take the time to say, if we are truly going to profess to be a Bible people, then we need to know how to rightly read our Bibles. And this past year, we declared 2022 to be the year of the Bible for Grace Church. And again, tongue-in-cheek a little bit, because we hope every year is the year of the Bible. We are constantly being sanctified by the truth. And Jesus said that God's word is truth. And yet, we wanted to use this as an opportunity. This year is an opportunity for you to challenge yourself, to go beyond yourself, to go beyond the status quo. And to really delve into the word, to dig deep, to mine its beautiful riches. And to find in God's word all that is sufficient for your faith through the power of his spirit. To find the beauty and the glory and the glimpse of Jesus that we have on every page. And so we, we've given you Bible verses to memorize that talk about the importance of the Bible, about the use of the Bible, about the inspiration of the Bible. And we've challenged you to be reading the Bible. Here's what we found. Um, we found that a lot of people who have been in the pews for years, sometimes even decades, have never actually taken the time to read the entire Bible. We found people in the pews, sometimes for decades, who've never taken the time to read the New Testament or the Old Testament. I, I discovered that there is a remarkable biblical literacy, not just out there, but actually in here. And that's, that's disconcerting. It's, it's, it, as, a, as your pastor, as a, as a shepherd of sheep, right, it, it concerns me. Because what we're saying on Sunday isn't always actually, actually what we're living out on Monday. 
And, and I've recently done a survey with the, uh, with the high school students. And, and for those of you who are here who are in high school who haven't received the survey, that's okay. I'm coming at you next. But, but I just said, hey, listen, I'm going to give you a spiritual survey. I want you to check it out. I don't want you to check it out. I don't want any clues to who this might be. And I don't want you to tell me what I want to hear or what your parents think you, or what you think your parents want to say. I want you to tell me what you actually think. And it was simple questions about the Christian faith, about what is absolutely true, about what is right and wrong. If there is such a thing at all, do you believe in a God? Do you believe the Bible is God's word? And here's what I found. There's a disconnect between what we say with our mouths or what we show up and and profess on Sundays and and what we live out on Mondays. Because one of the uniform patterns in in our group even amongst the kids I would say are remarkably solid, is we're not getting into the word enough. Not nearly enough. And, and when they self-examined in an anonymous perspective, they, they came to that conclusion. Now, I'm going to give a briefing uh, to the parents, not with names, but just with statistics based on our youth group. But, but some of the things I found there were very informative, very shocking, but also very um, concerning. And, and I hope that that would raise up in us an alarm a warning flag, hey, listen, we we need to double down on what we're teaching, what we're discipling, because our our kids aren't always getting it. Just came back from Survive yesterday, uh, which is our annual retreat to Lost Island Lake, where Denny and Pam are graciously allow us to use their cabin, and we take the kids out boating, have a great time, we look at the text of Scripture, and and it's, it's, um, really, it's more of a challenge to the adults to survive (laughs) <laughs> because you got all these kids. We had 18 kids, and I, I'm like, okay, I'm going to cap it there, because if I have more than that at one time, it's really hard to get them all in, in one thing and focus, because, you know, you got fifth graders, 12th graders. It's just, you know, it's a big difference. But at the very beginning of Saturday morning, as we start off, I, I not only do a lesson with them, but I also say, okay, since you're not here with your parents, go do pri- uh, private devotions by yourself. Go do a quiet time with the Lord by yourself. And if you don't know how to do that, come talk to me. Every one of those kids comes from a church family. Every one of those kids comes from a family in our church. And about half the kids show up at my doorstep going, how do I do private devotions? Christianity is both caught and taught, right? But sometimes I I think we may lean too heavily on the caught part in our parenting and a little too heavily on the taught part from our pastors, And yet, if I read Deuteronomy chapter 6, let me just read that for you. Here's what it says to parents. And these words that I command you, that is the doctrine of the scriptures, today shall be on your heart. So so we first have to imbibe them. It's not enough to simply profess them. We must possess them. We must take control of us from the center out, from the inside out. And yet, it doesn't just stay with us. Verse 7 says, You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be on as frontlets between your eyes, you shall write them down on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. According to God, his word should be of such priority that it, 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 it just seeps out of us. It oozes out of us, and specifically, first and foremost, to the people you're closest to. If it's something that just exudes from you, then as it boils over into other people. The first people it should hit are the people you love the most, including our kids, including our wives, including our grandkids. And so when I I see half of our kids don't know how to take personal time with God, and I say, have you done this? Has it been taught to you? No. That scares me. Because this isn't a suggestion, this is a command. We must do this. If we are to be faithful to Jesus, if we are to fulfill the command of what we are called to, if we are going to be Christians, this is what we must do. And it's not like, here's the other side of this, right? There was a day, not too long ago, where you could at least trust that your kids were getting something 
by osmosis of the Christian worldview and of the biblical truth from the culture at large. Because Christianity, while I don't think we were a Christian nation, I think we were so heavily influenced by Christianity, a lot of Americans walked around with this biblical, as it were, hangover. And there was just this back knowledge in the back of their mind where certain things came out and certain things were presupposed because the Bible was such an influential part of our culture. Right? Thomas Jefferson was a deist. But Thomas Jefferson also wrote in the Declaration of Independence that we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. Life, liberty, the the pursuit of happiness. Where do you get that concept from? So according to Jefferson, right, your rights don't come from the government, don't come from the state because the state's not God. They come from God who made you, who created you in his image, endowed you with that image so that you have value, you have dignity, and are to be treated with respect. Now, has that been treated very hypocritically in the past? Absolutely, 100%, not arguing that point. What I am arguing is that there was such an influence on culture, even when we went the wrong way, there was such a conscience that, 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 that we would at least profess these things. And just to lower this down to the common day, you know, there was a time when if I got, went and talked to people about, I don't know, da- David and Goliath, you kind of had a, you had an understanding of what I was talking about. If I started talking about Moses in Egypt, you understood what I was talking about. I go out in the culture today and I have those same conversations, nobody has a clue who Moses is. Not a single idea about who David was, or Goliath, or that story. And yet, at the same time, we're, we're, we're so biblically illiterate, not just in the church, but even more so in the culture, but the culture still has a thing that they have a biblical literacy that they don't. And so you have a bunch of people going, listen, I'm, I'm, um, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Like, I, I believe in something. Um, but, you know, I, I just, I, I've, I've, I've kind of walked away from the Christian faith. And then when you ask them, what exactly are you walking away from? You find that it, it's this straw man argument because they've never actually encountered biblical truth. They don't know what they're walking away from anymore. They just haven't realized that they don't even have the knowledge to really reject what they claim to be rejecting in the first place. And yet, we're, we're sliding down this hill at such breakneck speed. And one of the statistics that just came out that kind of shocked me um, was this. Baptist Press reports from uh, this year that the number of Americans accepting the Bible as a literal word of God has reached the lowest point since Gallup began the survey in 1976. Only 20%, of, Christi- or only, only 20% of Americans would say that the Bible is the word of God. And by saying that, they're not saying that the Bible's inerrant. They're not saying that the Bi- they're, not, they're not affirming Christian orthodoxy. They're not saying that they believe everything of the gospel. They're just saying, yeah, I mean, I think the Bible is an authority for our lives that comes from God. Jehovah Witnesses can sign on to that statement. Secular deists could sign on to that statement. Thomas Jefferson, who took scissors to his Bible and cuts, cut parts of it out, could technically sign on to that statement. And yet only 20% of Americans do. And then we were shocked when we go, okay, um, if we, Gallup did another survey where they said, okay, if we take six benchmarks, right, do you believe that there is such a thing as right and wrong? Right for everybody, wrong for everybody. Like, let's just say, is wrong. Do you believe that you should share your faith with other people? Do you believe that you are saved by grace? Do you believe that Jesus lived a sinless life? Do you believe that God is all-powerful? So by, by those six benchmarks, technically a Muslim could sign on, a Mormon could sign on, a Christian could sign on, right? Only 9% of evangelicals could affirm that in good faith. That, that's our tribe. That's, those are our churches. And so then they, they went a little deeper and said, okay, well, this is what's going on in the pew. What about the pastors? And what they discovered was only 51% of Protestant pastors hold those same truth claims of a biblical worldview. And by biblical worldview, we're not talking about a systematic theology quiz. We're talking about just those six statements, which I just said, Muslim, Jehovah Witness could sign on to. You get into the, the highest number of pastors by denomination is the Southern Baptist Convention, if you do the larger denominations, with 79% um, affirming those six statements, which my big question, because I, I, I started in the SBC, is uh, what's going on with those other 21%? I'm shocked it's that high, right? 
on the flip side, you, 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 start, you encompass all the other Baptists in the United States, you're at 58%. You go to the mainline denominations, you're at um, 27% in the Methodist church, which is the best and most healthy of them. You go to all uh, black Protestants, you're at 35%. Charismatics and Pentecostals, 44%. So the reason why this stuff is not getting taught, or the reason why it's not getting caught, is because it's not being taught from the pulpit. And so I'm proud to be part of a church that, that preaches the whole word of God. What is it Paul said as he's meeting with the church in Ephesus for the final time? He looks at the elders. He says, listen, I am innocent of your blood. It's a heavy statement. What are you talking about, Paul? Because I did not shrink back from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. I was in your homes. I was preaching from the pulpit. I showed you with tears what God's word says, and I did not fail, and I did not, didn't hold back from, well, that's kind of awkward, or that's kind of politically incorrect, or that one part's just weird, so I'll just leave that part off. No, no, no. He preached the whole thing. But friends, what's taught in the pulpit isn't always guaranteed to be received in the pews, and that's why it's not just the pastor's job to teach God's word. It's the parent's job. It's the grandparent's job. It's every person's job. If we truly are a great commission people, the great commission being found in Matthew 28 where Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Well, if we're going to do the teaching and we're a great commissioned people, that means you're the ones doing the teaching. You're the ones doing the proclaiming. You're the ones doing the sharing. Or you're the ones being disobedient. And part of me goes, okay, at the best, at what's, what's happening here is there's a, there's, a, there's a lack of confidence. A lack of confidence in how to read the word. A lack of confidence and maybe I, I don't understand it as well and I may not be able to answer all the questions. Here's First thing I want to tell you is, you're not commanded to answer all the questions. You're commanded to be faithful with what you got. You go with what you have. Th- think, think of the man who was, uh, who was a, the blind man who was made to see by Jesus, right? The Pharisees go, who is this, Je- who, who is this Jesus? Who healed you? What, what are we supposed to do? What does he say? I don't know. I don't know. All I know is I was once blind and now I see. And if you can't say that, there's something wrong with your spirituality, with your Christianity. Because every Christian can say that. Every Christian has had the eyes of their heart enlightened, has been able to see. Every Christian has been raised from spiritual death to life. That's why we baptize you. That's why we say buried with Christ in baptism, raised to newness of life. That's not our words. That's the words from, from the Bible. And if that's true, then we have a responsibility. And so what I want to do with what we, the time we have left is to simply walk you through how to read your Bible, to give you basic principles for how to interpret, how to understand, how to read faithfully and clearly, and then be able to employ and apply what Scripture says for your life. Because I, I hope that's the issue, right? I hope the issue is just a matter of hermeneutics. And by hermeneutics, it's a fancy word of saying the corrective lens, right, glasses, through which we accurately interpret and understand what the text is saying, right? So we bring to the Bible certain means through which we interpret, we read, we comprehend and understand what God's word says. And what I want to do is just take the next few moments to walk through what are the rules for interpreting scripture? What are the rules, the guardrails that keep you from misinterpreting scripture and walk you into truth and walk you into righteousness so much so, much so that you can understand and comprehend what God's word says? Yes, sir. The corrective lens. So what I mean by that is there are times where you come to the scriptures with the, the, the cultural presuppositions of our time period, right? You read it like a 21st century American. So, for example, when, when we read a lot of the epistles and we hear the you there, what we're thinking is me personally, singularly, right? But the Greek is written in the Greek. 
in, in the Greek, they have a second person pronoun that distinguishes between you individually and you plurally, right? In the South, we say y'all, right? You got y'all, and then if you're really from like Kentucky, you say youins, as opposed to you. And even in the East Coast, you know, you got you versus you guys, right? And then we come to the Midwest, which is you, know, right? And, and you can mean either way, and no one knows for sure what you're talking about unless they can actually look at who you're staring at at the moment. Here's the reason I say that is because when you read the epistles, oftentimes we, we take it as a direct message to me personally in a vacuum. But you realize, like, the letter to the church of Corinth is to a church. The letter to the church in Ephesus is a letter to a church, which means the, the second person imperatives, the, the commands, you do this, it's actually y'all do this. And, and because we're Americans, we're very... We believe in personal autonomy. We believe in independence. We believe in freedom. And my heart's the only thing that really counts when it comes down to it. We, we lose that corporate nature of Christianity. So it becomes just Jesus and me under a tree, right? That, that's one of the big deficiencies of seeing the American culture. And it comes from um, just the, 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 the presuppositions, that the notions we have that come from our culture, the attitudes that we bring for, as a 21st century America, and we can accidentally read those into the Bible. And so what I want to do is, is allow the text to speak for itself, and I want to teach you how to do that by using these rules as a corrective lens. All right? Number one, Scripture interprets Scripture. Scripture interprets Scripture. The best interpretation of Scripture that you will ever find is other places in Scripture. So if you find a place where you're not sure what it means, you look up what the other texts say about that text or what the other passages of Scripture say about the principle being laid out in that text. The Bible is its best interpreter because the Bible is spirit-inspired. So that means every time an apostle speaks on the same subject as another apostle, we assume, one, that God doesn't stutter and he doesn't contradict himself, which means if I don't get it here, I go check it over there. Or if I have a conclusion here and I'm not sure if I'm right, I go check it with the rest of Scripture. That's called using the scope of Scripture, the broad spectrum of Scripture. I've talked about this before, but so oftentimes when you see cults or, or people who are seeking to twist or misinterpret Scripture, they zero in on one passage, take it out of context, twist it, warp it, and then throw it back at you like it's the ultimate truth. And I've shared this before, but when I was in another state, in another town, uh, discipling another young man, I was at a Starbucks, I was waiting for him to show up, we were going to do a Bible study, and I had my Bible out, and I was just pre prepping, checking, making sure I was ready to rock and roll with him, and this dude comes up to me and goes, hey man, what, uh, what you got there? I was like, well, it's a Bible. He's like, well, I know it's a Bible, but can you read that Bible? I said, yeah, I, I can read that Bible. And he goes, you sure? All right, dude, I'm game. Bring it on. What, what? And, and so... He lays out for me, and within 30 seconds, I realize he's a, he's a Jehovah Witness. So they, they don't believe Jesus is God. They don't believe you're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. They believe that you, you have to do good works in order to get right with God. And so we start walking through the passages. And what would happen is he would read one passage of Scripture, completely rip it out of context, say, that verse right there proves my point. Well, I mean, I, I can see if you, like, read that verse and, Scribble out everything else on that same page, sure, why not? But if you actually read that verse and you, in its broader context and then you apply this cultural context, then uh, no, that doesn't say that at all. And I explained to him why it doesn't mean what he thinks it means. But then I'd flip, flip over to another scripture and say, okay, now that I've addressed that, what about this passage right here? Romans 9, 5, to them belong the patriarchs and from their race according to flesh is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever, amen. What do you do with that text? John 8, 58, 59, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. What do you do with that passage? Because that seems to be Jesus quoting from Isaiah 40, where Yahweh says, I am who I am, which comes from Exodus 3. And, and instead of answering my questions, what he would do is he'd smile at me. He had the, the Bible was in front of me. He's looking at me. He'd smile, and he'd start moving the pages of my Bible, like I couldn't see what he was doing, and then go back to the passage he wanted to talk about. One of the key giveaways that somebody's a false teacher or that they just don't understand their Bible is when they can't deal with what the text says in 
text, and they have to run back to one text, and they can't explain the whole corpus or the whole scope of Scripture. Scripture interprets Scripture. And that means we have to know it in context. When you don't understand something, don't assume that the author of Scripture is stupid. Assume the fact that there is some lack of information you have on your part that doesn't shed light on what this actually means. So, if I want to understand a passage, I read it in its context. I read it in its immediate context, like the, the paragraph. I read it in its broader context, in the chapter. I read it within the context of the book that's being written. I read it within the context of the writer who's writing it. Right? So if I'm reading 1 Corinthians, I want to check what Paul writes also in Ephesians or in Galatians. And then I read it in the, in the broad passage of redemptive history. Where does this fit? Why does it say what it says here? I also look at it in its historical context. What's going on in the first century that makes sense of this passage? And I'm going to get to explain how you do that in a second. But Scripture interprets Scripture. Second, the main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things. I'm completely ripping this from Alistair Begg, and I'm not going to even try to do a Scottish accent. But this is a brilliant way of reminding you. It's a, it's a big, brilliant hook because it, it rhymes, so it sticks in your mind, right? Uh, of Listen, if, if it's obscure or obtuse, and I'm not sure I quite get it, it's probably not the main point. Because when scripture gets to the heart of the issue, it speaks with exclamation points. There's no getting around it. There's no second guessing it. And so when you get to a place where you're like, I'm not sure what I do with that. Sorry. I'm not sure what I do with that. Then then back up for a second and go, okay, what's the main point of the passage? And let me put this specific question within the context of that main point. If that's the main imperative, then that informs and sheds light on how I'm going to understand this other passage over here. And again, that's scripture interpreting scripture. Number two, number three, excuse me. The authors of scripture are not stupid. I know I said that earlier, but but stay with me, right? What I mean by that is when Paul teaches us in 1 Corinthians 11 about women prophesying and then says later in the same book that I do not permit a woman to speak, he's not contradicting himself because you wouldn't contradict yourself in the course of 15 minutes and talking. So don't assume that Paul's dumber than you are. Rather, understand what Paul means when he says, I do not permit a woman to speak in the gathering of the saints. What he's talking about is authoritative preaching and teaching. Why? Not because women are lesser than men. Not because women are somehow uh, ontologically not our equals. Both are created in the image of God. Both have a valuable part to play within within the roles of the church and in the positions of the church. But there are specific positions like the teaching and preaching position of an elder that is reserved for qualified men. And so, don't assume that the passage contradicts itself. A lot of times when somebody says, well, I don't believe the Bible, I go, okay, pray tell. I'm game. I love having those conversations. Tell me, where, what, what, why do you not believe the Bible? Well, because Scripture contradicts itself. Can you give me one? 95% of the time they can't. And then the other 5%, when they give you the contradiction, it really don't even take too much investigation. You can just say, well, actually, you don't understand what's being said. Let me walk you through what that passage actually says. Which means either they just don't want to hear it, or two, they're being obtuse. Most times when people like to claim contradiction in Scripture, it's really easily explained away. In a way that they would not, with an interpretative lens that they would not bring to any other conversation or any other book of literature that they read in their own life. The authors of Scripture are not stupid. The main things are the plain things. Scripture interprets Scripture. Number four, number, excuse me, number five, we have what's called the ladder of abstraction. And this is kind of where we're going to get to today in our passage, in our text. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, you have Paul talking about head coverings for women. He talks about men not having long hair, men not wearing uh, head coverings while they're in church or while they're praying. In fact, he calls it a shame to them. Right? And, and we go, okay, uh, well, s- s- that has come over a little bit to us today where you, you'll notice oftentimes when we have corporate prayer or something, guys will take their hats off. Uh, and that is a sign of respect. I get it. But how do we interpret these things? Let me give you a case in point. How do we not interpret these things? My brother-in-law um, went, we, we, we grew up in Detroit, bad, really bad schools. Um, and so my in-laws decided to put their children in uh, a little Baptist school. Problem was, it was, it was a, a KJV only fight and funny church. And, and I, I mean no disrespect to my fundamentalist brethren. There's a lot of good ones out there. Um, they're just more godly than I am. But in this case, they were legalistic. 
They were legalistic to the point where my brother-in-law um, showed up with a haircut that touched his collar, and the teacher said he wasn't getting into heaven. Right? Now, this was the 90s, so it's, it's changed a little bit, but there's still that, that whole, that group out there. I had another buddy who was a pa- uh, pastor at a fundamentalist church, and um, he, he got up, well, actually, he didn't even get up and preach with it. He, he uh, gave out some sermons by John MacArthur, where MacArthur preached from the New King James, and this was, there, were, there was a segment of the church that was like, no, 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 King James, and the King James from 1611 is the only inspired Bible out there, so the rest of this is, is nonsense, garbage, and, and satanic deceit. Um, and so he, he didn't even preach from the pulpit with anything other than the King James. But when he got there to preach the next week, half the congregation opened up newspapers, just ignored the preacher. Okay, that's how you don't interpret Scripture. All right, in the same way, like, I'm, I'm not questioning your sanctification if your hair touches your collar, right? But you have to understand, that's from wrongly interpreting Scripture. So what I want to teach you is, is a tool called the ladder of abstraction. The ladder of abstraction, right? The ladder of abstraction realizes that there's a cultural difference between the 21st century and the 1st century. That there are times where when we look back at passages of Scripture and we we try to understand what's going on, that we're missing out on certain historical meaning, and because of that, we, 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 we twist Scripture, we warp Scripture, or we misunderstand Scripture, We're confused by it, and the danger is that we make a one-for-one comparison and say, what's true here must also be true there. Well, there is truth here, and there is truth there because truth is universal, but its cultural context may change. So if we have this as the first century, and this as the 21st century, There is a difference in the culture. There is a difference in the way we live. There is a difference in the language we use. There's a difference in how we dress. And those things are going to shift things and change things just a little bit. So we have to understand there is underneath an undergirding moral principle because there is the undergirding moral law of God written into the nature of creation, right? God does not change. His word does not change. His law does not change. But cultural context does change. All right? And so we have this cultural context that is always shifting because culture is shifting. The way we live is shifting. The technology is shifting. The clothes we wear, the fashions we use, all of this is shifting. So God's word remains the same. The moral principle remains the same. I just realized, LeVon, you can't see this. I'm sorry. So, okay. So the moral principle remains the same. So the question we have to ask ourselves, when we get to a text like 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where we're talking about long hair versus short hair, is what is the cultural context being employed? And then based on that cultural context, what is the moral principle at work? Right, the moral principle at work in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is not that long hair is inherently bad and, sh- or is, yeah, and short hair is inherently good. Right? We know that because it changes based on the gender. We also know that because, uh, well, you got Samson in the Old Testament, the book of Judges. He takes a Nazarite vow, he doesn't cut his hair. We're not saying Samson's in sin because he has long hair. But what's the moral principle that's being, that's being laid out here for us to apply? Tell you what, just because 1 Corinthians 11, Peter's going to do that one, I'm going to take a different text, all right? Let's take first Ephesians chapter 5, verse 13. Be not drunk on wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, okay? So, in the first century, what was the common alcoholic be- beverage that people could get intoxicated with? It was wine. They're in the Middle East. They're heavily influenced by Greco-Roman culture. In all of those places in the Mediterranean, what is the most fermented fruit? It's grapes, and people are like, well, back then, they didn't have the same fermentation process. They didn't have all the chemicals. We Listen, you take grapes, you crush them out, you put them out in the sun, eventually you're going to have a drink that can put you down. That's just how that works. That's nature. So don't tell me it's not, it's not uh, intoxicating. It was. That's why there's a command, do not be drunk on wine. But what some people want to do is say, that's okay. That makes me feel a whole lot better about myself because I'm not drinking wine. I'm drinking tequila. And, I, you know, as a pastor, you're like, 
you get an A in missing the point, right? <laughs> like, way to blow it, dude. Be- because the whole idea here is this juxtaposition between having your mind intact and your mind informed and your mind being fueled and filled by the Holy Spirit of God where love and an awe of God turns into a wonder and, and warms your heart and you are in such communion with Christ that you can't, that, that nothing else matters, right? The, the, the comparison here, is intoxication with wine which robs you of your faculties yet makes you feel good with something that informs your faculties, fuels your faculties, brings your faculties to what they always were supposed to be, namely loving God and beholding Him and then having that as your ultimate priority where everything else fails in comparison and where everybody else thinks you're nuts who's not a Christian. You're going to give up your job to be a missionary? You, you, You give money to your church? You're not going to go golfing. You're going to go to church on Sunday? You take time out of your busy schedule to read your Bible? Dude, you guys are a cult. You may have heard this before, right? The whole idea is your knowledge of God informs your love for God in such a way that your actions for God are completely different and alterable from everything else you once were to the point where everybody else kind of looks at it like you're drunk. And in comparison, Paul is saying, you can have that or you can have this, but you can't do both. If your faculties are impaired in such a way that you can't behold God, understand God, and then love God from your heart, then there's something wrong with what you're doing, namely drinking. Not because there's something wrong with the grapes, but because there's something wrong that happens in you. Which means Paul's not talking about wine. Paul's talking about any chemical substance that alters your mind in such a way that you can no longer interpret, appreciate, understand who God is, what God has done, and that changes your affections. If you say, well, I, I'm not getting drunk on wine, I'm getting high with grass, or uh, I don't know, I, I'm drinking tequila, or LSD, whatever the issue might be, you're in violation of this command. Why? Because we move the cultural context, but the moral principle remains the same. That's why Paul puts it in contrast, be not drunk on wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. You don't do this, so you can do that. Which means drunkenness is a violation of God's moral law, not because grapes are bad, not because wine is bad. Paul tells Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach. Drunkenness is bad because it robs you of a knowledge of God, which robs you of a love of God which robs you of the purpose for which you were created. It makes you less than you were meant to be. And the same thing applies, and we need to talk about this because we're going to deal with this in the next couple of decades. The same thing applies for any form of getting high. Day is coming when this country is going to legalize marijuana. That's just, it seems like that's a foregone conclusion at this point. And I'm going to tell you, the church is going to stand on this moral principle, and it's still a sin, and we're still going to treat it as a sin in this church. Not because we hate people, not because we want to draw lines, not because we want to be mean, but because we want you to know Christ. Because we want you to know, in knowing him, to, to realize his love and then to love him back. To find the purpose for which you were created for and to live with the nobility which he has endowed you with. And not to waste your life. This ladder of abstraction where we move the cultural context, but we ask the question, what is the underlying moral principle? Is how we look at the passage in such a way as to say, what's the pattern of meaning? What's the principle behind the pattern? And how do I apply the principle to my life today? You know, I got three minutes. I'm going to do one more. And this one's going to be a little more, uh, what's the word? Um, confrontational within Christian forms, right? I, I'm what's referred to as a cessationist, which means I believe that the apostolic sign gifts of the first century have ended. I don't believe people speak in tongues anymore. I don't believe people prophesy. Now, I want to say this really quickly. There's a spectrum in our church. We guard that spectrum, right? There are people who believe differently than me, more power to them. Many of them are more godly than I am, right? But I believe that. Yet, even as I bring that presupposition to the text, because I see it in other places and in Scripture, Right? I can't deny other parts of Scripture that don't fit in with my understanding of the Bible. Or that don't, uh, that I can't allow the Bible to contradict itself. Does that make sense? So in one place, I see the signs of apostle and prophet were done amongst you. And then I see in Ephesians 2.20 that the, that, the, uh, that the prophets 
apostles were the foundation of the church that was laid for one time at the very beginning and has now ceased, right? Now I take that over and I, I, I read in other places in the Apostle Paul where he says, do not despise prophecies. And you have to ask the question, okay, well, if I'm in the 21st century and I think prophecies no longer exist, does that mean that passage has no meaning for my life? No, because there's always a moral principle underneath. There's always a message for all people because scripture is universally true because the moral law does not change because God does not change. So what is the meaning for my life today of not despising prophecies? Well, fundamentally, what is prophecy? I'm going to argue based on scripture, what I understand of scripture, my interpretation. Prophecy is the word of God coming to bear on the people of God. And in the Old Testament and New Testament, that prophecy came through a person, right? So a prophet is someone who received that message from God and then gives that message to other people. Says, thus says the Lord. And when Paul says, you shall not despise prophecy, what he's saying is you do not dismiss the word of God, however it comes to you, in whatever form. So the command to not, do not despise prophecy is a command not to despise God's word as it comes to you, but to submit to God's word as you would to Christ. Why? Because it is though Christ speaks to you through his word and through the preaching of his servants. And I'll just be honest with you. Um, I always assume that people, when they're being quiet during a sermon, uh, that they're just agreeing with you, right? Like, I figure, you, you know, if you disagree, you'd probably shout out something or come on talk to me afterwards. And what I've discovered over time is just because people sit there and not doesn't mean they're agreeing with anything you say. And how I know this is because I hear, I hear the kids, and they will argue with me, which is great. I love it. Because I'm like, hey, at least you're being honest with me, and I can, I can engage with that, right? You're just too young to have that fear of man where you're not willing to say something, right? And so one of the students... I was talking about being created in the image of God yesterday, and I was teaching them from Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, and Genesis chapter 3, and I was talking about the importance of humanity, the uniqueness of humanity, and how that is different from every other creature on this planet. They have, they, they have the image of God in a way that no other animal does. That's why we're not part of the animal kingdom. Don't care what your biology professor says. Which means, if the house is on fire and your enemy's in one room and your dog's in the other one, which one do you go get? Get the, you go get your enemy and you save his life because he's the image of God. And one of the kids is like, I'm getting my dog. <laughs> but see, that brings us right back to the heart of it, right? That's where do not despise prophecy comes in. Well, you can do that. The question is, who are you going to follow? Who are you going to submit to? And is this God's word? If it is, then you're not arguing with me. Your contention is with God. Friends, may we be a Bible people, not just in word only and not just on Sundays, but Monday through the rest of the week. May it be what we believe, what we, what we breathe. Charles Spurgeon once said of John Bunyan, one of, two of my favorite guys, right? If you can pick, so Spurgeon says of Bunyan, he says, if you pricked him, he bled bibbling. It is my deepest desire that that be said of me. It is my deepest desire that that be said of my son and my daughter. And it's my deepest desire that that be said of you as well. May we know God's word. May we understand God's word. May we hide God's word in our hearts. And then may we share and teach and preach God's word to all the watching world because it is a dark place and they need the light of Christ. And faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would make us a Bible people, that you would incline our hearts to your testimony, that you would help us to love this book, not because we like to be smarter than other people, but because we cling to the book, because in it we see Jesus, and we love Jesus. May we share that love with others. May we share it with our kids, with our grandkids, with our neighbors, with our coworkers. I pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thanks, guys.